Good afternoon. Hello and welcome everyone to the uh, Exploring Campus Architecture Lecture with Professor Barry Bergdahl. This is the first of many exclusive programs for our newest alumni community, the Golden Lions. We're going to give it a, a minute or two for some more folks to hop on, but in the meantime, if you'd like to drop your name and class year into the chat function and maybe your your favorite building on campus to kind of get things going, that, that might be a good place to start. Um, also next to the chat option is a Q&A uh, option that uh, there will be time at the end of this lecture, about 20 minutes or so, for audience questions. So if you have any question at all during the lecture, please feel free to, to drop it in that box. We, uh, Professor Barry Bergdahl will be kind of filtering through. We probably won't have time to answer everything, but uh, we'll try and get around to everyone. Okay, so Without further delay, I would like to introduce our featured speaker, Professor Barry Bergdahl. Barry Bergdahl is the Meyer Shapiro Professor of Art History at Columbia University. Professor Bergdahl's broad interests center on modern architectural art, um, history with a particular emphasis on France and Germany post-1750. Trained in art history rather than architecture, he has an approach most closely aligned with cultural history and history and sociology of professions. Uh, his work has explored the politics of cultural representation in architecture, uh, the larger ideological content of 19th century architectural theory, and the changing role of both architecture as a profession and architecture as a cultural product in 19th century European society. He has worked on several film productions about architecture, in addition to curating numerous architecture exhibitions, and has written extensively on the history and the inherent problematic nature of exhibiting architecture and history of museological practices in relationship to architecture. Please welcome our distinguished guest, Professor Barry Bergdahl. Welcome. Thank you, Mitch. I'm delighted to be here. It's a really, oh, can people hear me? Yeah, it's a really beautiful day on Morningside Heights. So I wish you were all here and we will just be looking together at the campus and walking through its extraordinary spaces. Um, let me begin immediately by sharing my screen. Go into full. Here we go. Um, oops, sorry. Let's get back to the opening slide. And if I can just get rid of all of you, we can see the whole image. Um, so here we are, the first image uh, in the 1890s as Columbia is beginning its great move to uh, Morningside Heights, beginning to occupy this landscape of a city that hadn't quite caught up with it, although there was much city to the north and much city to the south often thought that the city progressed very regularly simply from the south to the north up Manhattan Island. But in fact, uh, Morningside Heights, as we'll see in a moment, was a bit of a gap in the development because it's one of the highest elevations on Manhattan Island. And originally, the um, particularly the horse-drawn trams uh, couldn't get up to this site. So it had remained some, somewhat remote into the late 19th century. This is very important for our, our story. I want to introduce the idea of the campus uh, if indeed we were here today, and if some of you hadn't been back for some years, you would probably start to notice small changes. But I think one of the things that's most dramatic about Columbia is how the vision of the architectural firm McKinney and White, who laid out the original campus in the 1890s, created a template uh, for the campus that remains its powerful image. It was unlike almost any university architecture up till that point, as we'll see. So it was a great innovative campus. I think some of us think of its neoclassicism as somehow retarded there, but it was, I hope to show you, uh, really advanced thinking in the late 19th century. And it served for the model for numerous other campuses, uh, not only in the United States, but even outside the US. If any of you travel to Cuba, you'll feel a shock of uh, familiarity at the University of Havana, which is modeled very closely on the Columbia campus as well as on the Berkeley campus. So let me take you back in time for a moment, uh, look at the development of this campus. Anyone who would like to read in great detail on the occasion of the um, centennial of Columbia's arrival on Morningside Heights, the opening of classes in the fall of 1897. In 1997, we staged an exhibition in the Wallach Art Gallery called Mastering McKim's Plan. You can still get probably for $1.95 on on internet book sites, a copy of this uh, catalog that we published at the time, but it's a very rich history of the university, much more detailed than I can give you in the 40 minutes or so that we have 
today um, at lunchtime. We might start just with some general evocations of the, oops, why is my screen not going forward here? Hold on a second. There we go. To the issue of the campus. The campus, even though it is, of course, a Latin word and goes back to the Romans, the idea of the campus martius, the exercise fields of the uh, Roman military in Rome, uh, on which stood, not coincidentally, uh, the Pantheon in Rome that you probably all know and that we'll see again, certainly know its descendant, Low Library. Uh, but the campus as a concept of a college or university education setting in which people would come and live and work and learn together, a campus that would be residential, is really an American invention uh, of the colonial period. The first place that we know that campus was used was not at Columbia or King's College for that matter in the 18th century, but at the College of New Jersey today, better known as Princeton. Uh, and you can see the first building referred to as the, the nodal point of a campus, Nassau Hall, uh, at uh, Princeton on the left. Uh, this was a break in the uh, British colonies of North America from the model of the British University. I'm showing you an aerial view, rather recent, of Cambridge University, uh, one of the prestigious ancient universities. And you can see that having emerged from the monastery, the campus quadrangle closed and internal, internalized to itself was the model of the British University. Already Princeton, but very quickly Columbia thereafter, established a very different relationship, particularly for the urban university, to the town uh, and those who were in fact not members of, uh, of the college or the university, which comes into being as a concept in the late 19th century, the research university, which looked very much to Germany and away uh, from England. So there is an underlying motif of defining a very American space the space of the campus. And Columbia will make a very distinctive and influential uh, iteration of that idea of what is the space, what is the architecture of the campus uh, when it made its second big move. So let's have a very quick look at Columbia before Morningside Heights. Some of you might know this from your time as students or because if you're here today, one assumes that you love the history of, uh, of our university. The first purpose-built uh, academic building uh, in the colonies in the late 17th century uh, was this so-called Wren building at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg. It is probably not by Sir Christopher Wren, as they like to think there, but it established this idea of a block with a central cupola, sometimes with a central entranceway, sometimes on a staircase system. And indeed, it was the staircase system that was adopted for Columbia's very first purpose-built building after the students moved from the vestry of Trinity Church on Wall Street to Park Place near City Hall. Uh, and built this rather substantial uh, building uh, for King's College, which would, of course, change its name uh, to Columbia College uh, after the American um, Revolution. Uh, but soon it became clear at Park Place that there was no room for expansion, despite the fact that there was already a landscape element. So even with this urban university, I want to emphasize the extent to which Columbia always, in its need for more space, has sought also to have exterior space, landscape space, uh, as a constituent part of the campus. Indeed, as we get to the Morningside Heights that you know so well, I want to emphasize that it is the voids, the open spaces that are every bit as important as the buildings uh, to the quality of the campus, the quality of life and learning here, uh, and the overall impression, which was to make the campus architecture so uh, influential. Indeed, many of the buildings are kind of background buildings that don't immediately um, come to mind as great pieces of architecture. It is the ensemble that um, develops as the great contribution of Columbia, not an aggregate of buildings, but the notion of a campus that has a harmonic overall uh, planning. Um, interesting to think about the problem of making such a harmonic urban campus in the grid plan of New York. As you probably all know, in 1811, a special commission was set up to plan the way um, Manhattan, then the full city of New York, to have the amalgamated five boroughs until the very end of the century. Indeed, that is really part of the uh, history of Columbia. We'll see in a moment. But the grid plan uh, doesn't lend itself, actually, to creating great open spaces, to creating the kind of civic plaza that we know at the center uh, of the campus here on Morningside. Uh, rather, you can see these buildings built in humble jumble. And when Columbia moves to what will be its third location, its second campus, 
right here on this one city block between 49th and 50th Street on the east side between Madison Avenue and what here is called 4th Avenue, the future Park Avenue, once the trains coming out of Grand Central would be roofed over to create those parks of Park Avenue. This opening is in fact a great problem for the college that will occupy this one block and begin to build. This, as we'll see in a second, is an existing building that they take over. The rest of the block was available for development. St. Patrick's Cathedral, the Guillard Houses by the architects McKinney and White, but McKinney and White don't enter our story quite yet. These three buildings will be built by Columbia College on what it thinks will be its future permanent campus. And interestingly, they build it. Here's what the, the site that's taken over. This leads to a lot of bad undergraduate jokes, but Columbia has a history of occupying institutions that were meant for um, people who somehow were going to be isolated from society, even as it tried to create a college that would integrate uh, with the city of New York. So in 1857, Columbia moved into and remodeled to a certain extent this building, uh, which was built as the New York Institution for the Instruction of the Deaf and the Dumb, an institution that moved uh, out from its quarters and sold this building uh, to uh, Columbia. The original asylum building had been erected in 1829 by the New York architect Marvin Thompson. Uh, and as you can see, it had quite an impressive setting on 49th Street. We still feel the city as kind of midway between rural and urban, the arrival, of course, of gas lighting, but the street still uh, unpaved. But rapidly that will change. Columbia will build out the site uh, with buildings built by a graduate of the college, Charles Coolidge Haight, uh, who built these very distinctive call them kind of early Victorian Gothic style buildings with this turret and this evocation uh, of, um, in fact, of the dominant Gothic style that was so popular in the mid 19th century, particularly for an Episcopalian institution uh, like Columbia College. Gradually, Columbia will, in a certain sense, push to the side uh, its origins in relationship to a specific denomination, to the Anglican um, church, but these very much looking like buildings that might find in the expansions of Oxford and Cambridge in these years. So here, a kind of evocation of a Anglican and English connection, particularly in the very English uh, neo-Gothic library, absolutely spectacular building with its iron uh, roof, uh, which is probably more famous in library history than in architectural history, although I think it was must have been an absolutely spectacular piece of architecture, extraordinary to think that Columbia would only use it for a little over a decade before it was decided that the 49th Street site was too confining. But as I said, probably more famous in library history because it was here that Dewey worked developing the Dewey Decimal System. I don't think many people realize that the Dewey Decimal System is in a sense a product of Columbia's growing library system. Soon the students, the books uh, were too much for 49th Street, but most particularly was the problem particularly not only on Madison Avenue, but with the trains on the traffic on Madison Avenue, but with the trains on Park Avenue, 4th Avenue, the scientists could not get accurate re readings in any of their laboratory equipment. So it is over and over again in the history of Columbia, the advances in scientific research and in the teaching of science and in the notion of the emergence by the 1880s of the idea that the university is not simply teaching students proper Latin and Greek, but is a research institution trying to not only memorize old knowledge, but create an advance new that we see a conflict, ironically enough, between the technology of transportation and the needs of science. This is, of course, at the very end of our story, going to be the sciences that lead to uh, former President Bollinger's decision that the campus needed to expand to the north primarily uh, for the exact sciences. So Columbia will abandon this campus and again move, even though they own the land under what is today Rockefeller Center, which was very lucrative real estate um, revenue, the decision is taken not to build in Midtown, to get away from development and to move all the way up Man uh, Manhattan Island to an area that's just starting to be laid out right up here on Morningside Heights. The grid plan is already legalized for Morningside Heights, but it only exists as a kind of sketch, partly a sketch on paper, partly a sort of figure in the mind, uh, when Columbia, like a lot of other Episcopalian founded institutions, begin to move to Morningside Heights, thinking it will be the center of a new New York. Now, what does that mean to say the center of the new New York will not be in Midtown Manhattan, 
which was bustling and developing. Columbia was moving away from that development. But Columbia's arrival on Morningside Heights coincides also with the creation of Greater New York, the incorporation of the five boroughs. And so for the minds of the trustees and then President Burgess led on by Pre President uh, Seth Lowe, uh, Morningside Heights was in fact not an eccentric location, but very much a regional center of a fastly growing world city for which Columbia now wanted to be first changing its name to Columbia University in the city of New York from Columbia College to University in the city of New York, but also with the desire to build a world-class uh, campus that would get recognition nationwide and beyond. So as I said, they're not the only institution. We're going to see in a moment others that are leaving, moving there, but I want first to indicate something of a issue for Columbia that I've already evoked, and that is the grid plan of New York. You see that the grid plan of New York with its narrow side streets and its wide streets that lead to the horizon, the Broadway, which goes on for miles and miles, um, or here a view of Fifth Avenue, uh, does not lend itself either to the creation of large open spaces or to the creation of an axial procession towards a great monument. So when we think, for instance, of Paris, I'm showing you up on the left, an impressionist Pizarro painting uh, of the Avenue of the Opera in Paris, which, where the opera building culminates the view. New York doesn't lend itself to this. Look at the problem of St. John the Divine on 111th Street, not exactly the Avenue of the Opera. Uh, and there the cathedral is crying out to be noticed, uh, quite dis different from what we see, uh, for instance, with um, in this Pizarro uh, painting. Um, so let's move ahead if I can. There we go. What a luck, therefore, that Columbia was able to buy a multi-block site from 116th to 120th Street that belonged to the Bloomingdale Mental Asylum. So we go from the deaf and the dumb to the mental asylum. And I'm sure you know, can imagine all the undergraduate jokes once they become aware of this story, this history. Uh, but there the Bloomingdale Asylum found that the encroaching city was not conducive to the um, treating the patients. And they decided to move to a large tract in Westchester County, where I believe they still are. And they, their land was purchased by the trustees very eager to have a four block site on which there did not have to be cross streets. So they suddenly had a very large piece of land to lay out a campus rather than to jam in a set of buildings uh, on a city block. Now, interestingly, this very site had been thought and proposed in New York's bid to host the World's Columbian Exhibition, the exhibition that was going to celebrate the centennial uh, the centennial, the anniversary of Columbus's quote unquote discovery of America. And here's a proposal for Morningside Heights as the site of the World's Fair. In the end, New York would lose out to Chicago and Columbia would move on to that site, acquiring here what you see, the main building of the Bloomingdale Asylum, which would be used for a number of years for classes as it was sort of gradually demolished and replaced by new buildings. They weren't the only ones. As I mentioned, other Episcopal institutions were coming up here on the lower uh, part of my screen. You can see the Episcopal Cathedral, St. John the Divine under construction, St. Luke's Hospital, originally an Episcopalian uh, hospital, all crowning this cliff on Morningside, this great rocky outcropping, which the designers of Central Park, Frederick Law Olmsted uh, and his associates were turning into Morningside Park. So here was a landscape that was emerging on an extremely high point between two planned parks, uh, Morningside and Riverside. Uh, uh, along Riverside, of course, Grant's tomb was under construction, but you can see how rural this site was, just a few houses. The first suggestion perhaps of apartment houses that might soon line Riverside Drive, but a great open space at a, uh, at a height on which McKim could imagine to build something that would have the monumental presence of say Parisian civic architecture, the aspirations of greater New York to civic architecture, Columbia wanted to make a contribution. And where was the inspiration going to come from? The failed project for New York for the World's Fair had nonetheless led to Chicago building the image of an American, an expanding American ideal city, famous white city. In fact, all of it built of temporary materials, but appearing to be a kind of Renaissance of ancient Rome uh, with this great figure of the Republic standing, lifting fame on a globe, 
looking up at the administration building of the World's Fair, the great domed main building of uh, the architect Richard Morris Hunt, and then along the side, buildings designed by different architects, but all with a consistent vocabulary and a similar roof line, you can see here, creating a harmonious whole out of a whole group of buildings. This was the birth of what was called the City Beautiful Movement, the integration of landscape and architecture to create a harmonious city, quite different from the hustle bustle of what we might call the city of capitalism. And this was to be an image that really struck the mind of the Columbia trustees, and in particular, the new president, Seth Lowe. He interestingly would go on to a career uh, in uh, politics and serve as mayor. He had been mayor of Brooklyn, he would then run to be mayor of the solidified New York. He actually paid for Columbia undergraduates to have study trips to the World's Fair, not only that they could look at its buildings, but of course, its contents. And at the end, he acquired the contents of the German pavilion, which had great volumes on how to build a research university. So the Chicago World's Fair was a real lesson in the choice of the architects. Not Chicago, the University of Chicago, newly founded and master planned as a kind of Cambridge uh, on the Midwest Plains. Rather, this is rejected, this notion of a neo-Oxford or neo-Cambridge in favor of turning to various architects. There's Seth Lowe. There is architects McKinley and White looking perhaps at the plans of the future Columbia. The idea of building a master plan university, not as a Gothic quadrangle, but something of civic grandeur that could rival in permanent form the great imagery of the Chicago World's Fair. So there it was again, uh, one of the photographs that uh, Lowe brought back for his architects. And in fact, McKim and Richard Morris Hunt were two of the architects who were put into a competition. One was Charles Coolidge Haight. He had designed Columbia's buildings at 49th Street. He was given a crack at it. He proposed a kind of quadrangle system up on Morningside Heights. The trustees and Lowe said, that's not our imagery. One, we want to get away from the imagery of, say, the theological seminary that Haight was building uh, down in Chelsea. We want something modern and new that declares the emergence of the university, not as the cloistered college, but as the great civic research institution on the landscape of New York. Richard Morris Hunt was a bit the dean of American architects. He'd actually built already in the neighborhood. Here's a building of his that still stands. Uh, on 103rd Street, today it's the youth hostel. He proposed a plan. You can see here on the left, these plans are a little hard to read because that is the existing Bloomingdale Asylum buildings and he's proposing to replace them with a series of pavilions organized along two continuous corridors. The inspiration are hospital buildings from 19th century Paris and London, but the trustees pass them over in favor of a younger firm, Charles Follin McKim. Next time you're on Low Plaza, you will walk over uh, this uh, monument to McKim that is at the very center of the plaza. And in fact, uh, the, uh, the Columbia campus was going to be, along with the University Club, along with Penn Station, former Penn Station, uh, and the post office, among McKim's great contributions to the city of New York. McKim's very first great public building had been the Boston Public Library. And this had got him great attention to someone who was bringing a new spirited harmonious classicism to American cities. The idea that the classical language of architecture could create a system of civic order, of grandeur, of aspirations uh, here um, on uh, Copley Square uh, in Boston. That in fact was going to serve as the first sketch for what he might imagine to be the center of our campus, but he's going to rethink it from the great architecture of Chicago. And here I want to show you quickly the very rapid evolution of the master plan. Already this idea of a master plan in which these outdoor courtyard spaces and open courtyards, not quadrangles, so, so to speak, but all of them open in some way, centered around, and this is a first, not a, or almost a first, not centered around a chapel, not centered around religion, but centered around the library. The idea that a composition would be created around the centrifuge of the library. The first proposal, which you see here in 1894, right after they're chosen from the three competing architects, is for a long longitudinal library, probably looking very much like Boston Public Library in reduced version for Columbia College, which didn't have quite so many books quite yet then, with a chapel over here on the side and a student assembly hall here, and then a great university hall that could house the entire population of the campus for both dining and assembly here that was going to be called University Hall, gradually 
occupying all the spot of the former asylum that you see there in dotted lines. You can't find anywhere in the archives the written reason why that plan shifts in one major regard uh, in between 1894 and the following year when this is the adopted plan. You can see the library becomes a domed quadrangular building pulling away and creating a great deal more open space on a artificial platform to be created that all of the buildings might sit on a great podium despite the differences of the terrain with a series of courtyards for buildings, engineering and natural sciences already uh, set, the uh, rest of them. So this would be ideal for laboratory experiments. This is what I'm actually sitting right here as I'm talking to you in Scammerhorn Hall, one of the first buildings to be built. Construction will begin first on the library and then on this part of the um, Northeast uh, quadrant. Um, with the chapel pushed over to the side and the, its equivalent in a secular assembly hall for student activities. So a shift from this, this is the first sketch we know uh, of the uh, future low library. McKim is drawing it. I want you to notice that there's a standing figure in front of it, might recall Chicago for you. Pointer doesn't want to cooperate and stay on the screen, but you can just see in the center of these great steps leading up to a porticoed and domed building uh, worthy really of ancient Rome. And indeed the model is a modified version of the Roman pantheon. The Roman pantheon, of course, the place where all of the gods, pantheon being that assembly of a totality, transferred into secular forms that all of the disciplines of knowledge, uh, uh, libraries, some of them specialized, some of them the general storage of books with originally seminar rooms in the stacks themselves so that uh, the professor of philosophy would be right next to the philosophy books, et cetera. Gradually, that didn't work as the books grew. Uh, the classrooms were pushed out of the library and ultimately the books were pushed out of the library too. The house, the administration, once the books moved only 30 years later to the library that you all know, but I'm getting ahead of my story. The inspiration, however, was not only ancient Rome. It was the history of the, the, the American Republic. The other model is of course, Thomas Jefferson's University of Virginia with its academic pavilions centered on the library at the center, this great domed rem of Jefferson's reinterpretation of the Roman pantheon for the American Republic at the University of Virginia. Interesting to note that there had been a terrible fire in that library in the early 1890s. And it was at that point being restored by Stanford White of the firm of McKim, Mead and White. In fact, three rotundas, White restoring University of Virginia, building the new campus of New York University in the Bronx that I can't talk to you about today, and McKim, his partner, the more Roman partner, building Columbia. The other model was Union College at Schenectady, which equally had a central library building with pavilions. So there were American sources that went back to the America of the foundation years of the Republic. Here is the campus as it is laid out, an absolutely um, neo-Jeffersonian in some way, the idea of a great central building for books that is a symbolic center, and then the others buildings. This was to be built originally, Seth Lowe thought, in marble. Uh, in the end, it was built in limestone uh, with a very experimental dome, partly of concrete. It housed the great reading room of the library, and then around it would be clustered buildings of nearly identical um, features, very dense buildings filled with very large windows, wasn't yet known the extent to which electricity could replace natural daylight for instruction, for laboratories and classrooms with a chapel, which ultimately will be designed not by McKinney and White, but by um, some young students from their firm, one of the finest buildings on campus. St. Paul's, I could give you a two hour lecture just on its fine features. And then what becomes Earl Hall, the Student Assembly Hall, and then a building that will never get realized, University Hall. This is Teachers College already emerging on the other side of 120th Street. But notice how much greenery there is, not only on the campus, as the campus moves from a very urban, great kind of plaza, piazza, what McKim will call simultaneously the Acropolis and the Forum of his university, a civic place for gathering that's largely paved, the landscaping pushed to the side. The landscape advisor here is none other than Olmsted, 
as though the landscape of Riverside Park and Morningside Park might weave through the campus. And then over here on 120th Street, a park linking part of the campus, but a park green space linking the two parks between river and cliff, if you will. So the idea of a central massive building, uh, ceremonial, but also central to the university's intellectual life, and then the background buildings, which uh, form the framework for it. But most important for McKim, and you can see it was built almost immediately, so important was this central space of what we now call Low Plaza, that it was built even before many of the classroom buildings. So the civic gesture of Columbia as a, a new ideal city uh, is the campus as ideal city, which is really McKim's great uh, idea, is established with the laying out of this great open space, even when there were only two of the original pavilions of the classroom, Scammerhorn and Fairweather, uh, built. This is still remnants of the um, of the asylum that was serving so-called West Hall. There's another building, the M Macy Villa. So many of these buildings were still um, in use. Columbia would acquire, we'll see in a moment, this additional site, 116th to 114th, only in uh, after the turn of the century. So here's the plan. Originally, perhaps gateways. There was some discussion about that. They were never implemented. And then low plaza. And the fact that the gateways were not implemented, and of course, we're living with this politically right now in all of the controversy over student protests and what, uh, how is this space, which of course is the private space of the university, but bleeds seamlessly into 116th Street, which was a public street until it was given to Columbia in 1954 under President Eisenhower, president of the university, not yet president of the United States, uh, as a gift from the city for Columbia's um, bicentennial in 1954. And then it became College Walk rather than 116th Street. But key here is the laying out of this plaza. And the plaza is, with its herringbone shaped bricks, an emulation of the floor of the Roman, um, of Roman buildings, but in particular, the Roman Forum. So the idea that this was the great place of exchange of public assembly, you can see the Dodge Hall is not yet constructed uh, there, uh, was very, very important to McKim from the beginning. Here's an early photograph, which I like very much because you can see something, uh, not only the campus is still only beginning to emerge, low library and all of its splendor, but most particularly the, ar the late arrival of the figure that was meant to be standard as Alma Mater sits down for her inauguration around 1905, uh, and there she is. So of course we could take this incredible tour into this building with its sequence of surprises. We climb up the steps to knowledge, to the library. We come in and are greeted by the figure of Athena and the Zodiac, and we see through the screen this kind of appeal to light. We're moving from semi-lightness to total enlightenment in the great reading room of the library, which you see here in two views and in which had in fact been installed this astronomical experiment of the phases of the moon, which were going to be projected onto the dome. So the idea of the Pantheon uh, as now a kind of secular accumulation of all knowledge that is present as the students gather in these round desks around the central distribution point for the books. The obviously simultaneous with a much grander example of the same concept, the Library of Congress main reading room opened in the same year that Columbia began classes on Morningside Heights. So there we have the full campus. Let me see what begins to happen now. Of course, gradually and slowly, this will be built out into the 19 teens, by which point the perimeter buildings will be built. But in fact, the only one of these inner pavilions that is ever built is Avery Hall for the School of Architecture. This building, this building, and this building are never built, and this building is never completed. So the upper campus is in fact much less dense, much less dense than originally intended. And I think we treasure very much something of an unintended informality and greater presence for planting, for flowers, for trees, for hedges, for benches than McKim planned in a very dense urban campus in which the main space would then give rise to much narrower spaces as we moved in. Here's Scammerhorn and Fairweather under construction uh, and you can see them being completed. And over here, just the first floor or the first floor visible of University Hall. Now, University Hall sits like these buildings at the point where the site drops over 100 feet uh, to 119th Street. Um, and there we can see the problem that they had from the beginning. This is the topography of the site. They picked a, a site near the height and they filled that out 
to create a great artificial platform so that everything goes up to the peak site and all this is landfill. So Columbia fits on an artificial um, pedestal. It's also why you never know when you go into a building, whether you're walking into the entrance on the first floor or the fourth floor or the fifth floor, uh, because the buildings go subterranean at very different um, positions. But here at about 119th Street, there therefore was a huge uh, fall down from the peak point to the natural topography of 120th. And there you see it. So this was laid out by Olmsted as so-called the Grove. 119th Street had to be kept open by city law. They were allowed to close 118, 117, uh, but 119 was left open as a service route going in the tunnel under University Hall, which is partly where the old gym is today. And this empty site uh, is going to become the victim of the need for expansion. Uh, it was first thought, perhaps, that it might even serve to create a dormitory complex because the original campus had no residential um, parts to it. It was thought the students would live in lodging houses nearby, but quickly they were afraid the students might go off to lesser places like Harvard and Yale. And so a kind of Harvard yard was proposed by McKim to create a dormitory complex around the open uh, walking and playing areas of the Grove with a vision of a completed university hall there as a kind of aula magna, uh, and then Teachers College painted here as though it doesn't exist uh, to the rural north. This was never going to happen. Instead, we begin to get a densification taking place. There's Patine, there's the undercroft of University Hall, never completed. The remnants of the grove, this is a view of about, probably about 1910, uh, and soon, this is University Hall, never completed, but by the 1960s, it will become the new business school. There you see the steel frame Urus under construction, but you can also detect that other taller buildings have begun to emerge as the Grove becomes the place for skyscraper Columbia. Uh, and so um, two things happen. 1903, this extension of the campus, the dormitory idea moved to the Columbia College campus, which becomes the residential part, part of the classroom with Hamilton and of course journalism, but then an even denser plan for an inner row of dormitories uh, at the lowest part of the site uh, with perhaps buildings down here. This is a big issue. Are we gonna close that or leave it open to the city? Is Columbia going to turn inwards or is it going to retain this great bleeding of the civic plaza into the urban realm where the neighborhood and the students mix together on low plaza. We're here today, I'm sure you would be able to distinguish who's a student and who's a resident of Morningside Heights or even somebody just coming to visit the campus, the civic nature. But gradually Columbia by force of things begins to turn in on itself. Uh, and you see this, but at least McKim, as he proposed this great extension, not yet thinking the need to densify to the North, still trying to hold on to the Grove, that this will be a propylaeum, there'll be an open gateway, but Columbia will have a new southern entrance as well as a broader entrance on 116. And this is what's happening between 1894 and 1903. But ultimately, you begin to see in the aerial view, this is going to densify. And we are looking south, no Butler Library. Columbia is still open to the south, but apartment houses are starting to rise. So what really happens is the notion that Columbia will be a monument on the landscape in the city is defeated by the growing scale, the growing height of the surrounding neighborhoods. In fact, Morningside Heights will become the first purpose-built apartment house neighborhood of uh, Upper Manhattan. Uh, Columbia even thought perhaps to acquire the whole area to the south and create a great boulevard leading up so that that might be able to compete with the grid, but this will never happen. And ultimately, in fact, what does begin to happen is that the Grove is given over to, uh, so forget about the Acropolis, Columbia will be disappear, not like the Parthenon, Low Library will no longer be uh, a monument on the landscape, will be become an internalized monument within the campus as Butler Library not only takes over the books, but closes the view to the south along with the incredible height of the dormitory at John Jay Hall. You can see in this aerial photograph from the 1930s, not only the greater height at the south, but now the beginning of the building of a great height in the filling in of the grove with what was planned originally a kind of skyscraper city. So there we have Columbia densifying, extending, taking the language of McKim, 
which was thought of as a series of Renaissance palazzos uh, disguising the uh, full density of them and extruding them to the skyscraper form. And you can see South Field beginning to emerge and the new um, dimensions there of John Jay and the college campus over to the left and here a much more contemporary view as the, as the school began to densify. But soon it was spilling out all over the place in every direction. Uh, almost like those of us who put on weight and spill over our belts with each year. Columbia began to spill to the East Campus, developed as a kind of modernist counterpart to the campus with the School of International Affairs. Uh, some buildings were earlier earlier over on this own land, Kazi Italiana, and of course, what was first started as Johnson Hall graduate housing. But the law school and the original plan for the School of International Affairs by the architects Harrison and Abramovitz, connected now by a plaza level. So the idea that the increasingly that students would remain on the campus even at a higher level rather than necessarily interacting with the sidewalk level. All of this coming up to the moment when Columbia's great expansion is checked uh, with the um, uh, with the debacle of the attempt to build the gym 1968 uh, in Morningside Park. This of course uh, was stopped. This was one of the instigations uh, for the student protests, uh, which closed down camp the campus and classes in April of 1968. And the subsequent history of the campus is entirely one of trying to find more space uh, without going onto city land. This was a plan for two skyscrapers to go onto South Field by the architect IMA, never took place. But gradually, Columbia begins to infill with some very intelligent buildings. This is one right next to where I'm talking to you, Fifth Sherman Fairchild by the architects McKinley, uh, excuse me, Mitchell Jurgela, who try to think of a way of making modern curtain wall building with these kind of fake brick panels that, that are hung on the building, but that recall they're simultaneously modern and contemporary, but they recall the architecture of uh, McKin. We won't speak about Eurus Hall one of the eyesores of New York City uh, on the left. Uh, more compelling is the recent Northwest building about 20 years ago now almost by Raphael Moneo. And then just to culminate, what happens when Columbia finally can't find any more land on its original expanded McKim Mead and White campus, doesn't want to fill in those spots that were intended for buildings originally, uh, and then the great acquisition of a second campus almost of equivalent size at Manhattanville to be master planned once again, not to be built building by building, but to have a master plan, this time by the Italian modernist architect, Renzo Piano, conserving again a much more limited but open public space at the center and a plaza-like extension. There are echoes of McKim's plan, rethought in steel and glass and curtain wall construction of this great glowing campus, which is still emerging to the north of 125th Street, just a, a view of it at night. And then one of the latest additions, the new building of the business school with this very innovative um, approach to the way the section of the um, spaces intervenes by Diller and Scafidio. So Columbia is a story that is continued to be written, but one of the most amazing things before I turn to your questions is that if you were to come here today, and if you even if you were from the class it graduated, let's say, 40 years ago, you would still immediately recognize, much like the University of Virginia, where one immediately recognizes the heritage of a great master plan, even as the university has changed in numbers and size and space and subject matters, and even in its footprint in the city. It is still McKim's vision of 1894 to 1897, which dominates as the image of Columbia University in the city of New York. This vision of an urban university as simultaneously an acropolis and an ideal city of learning. So I'll end there. Sorry, I can't see you, the audience, but I'll go into the um, questions and answers and see what we might um, take from that. I'll maybe leave the, um, uh, the um, PowerPoint open in case we need to go back. Uh, Michael Marino asked, how have the new campus builders at over time adhered to broken from or enhance the existing campus vernacular. I think if I just take this back for one minute, and my slides will reverse. I think you can see that there's something of a tension that goes on 
in this history of more recent buildings. Now, this is a, a, a broad recent uh, interpretation of more recent because we're looking at the 60s with the uh, building that is a marked departure, brings essentially a kind of standard issue office building by the Urist brothers uh, here that one could find equally in a office park in New Jersey or in Midtown Manhattan in those years uh, for the School of Business. So the business students would already be in an environment to where they were going rather than where they came from uh, that declares a complete break, uh, not only in scale as it builds on the foundations of University Hall, which are below it. By the time, about 15 years later, by the time this building is being conceived, um, Jergala uh, is, who by then will become a professor at Columbia Architecture School, a, uh, a modernist contextualist. And so he's trying to figure out ways in which his building, which is a, in fact of the same curtain wall steel frame construction as Eurus, will begin to be a much more complicated affair by these screenings, by this evocation of windows that recall the windows of the building, as I of the other buildings, the McKim building, the um, do we interpret this as a modernized vision of the brick pavilions with their white trim, uh, or do we see it almost as the walkways turned up in the vista of the campus? He takes the perspective line of that sidewalk and continues it with a break uh, on his building right where it throws a bridge out and lets you get back to the brick university bu um, engineering building of the 1950s. Um, same thing here um, with the great Spanish architect, Rafael Moneo with the Northwest Corner building, obviously it's a modern skyscraper building and fully glazed, but then he picks up on certain elements such as the um, limestone bases uh, on which it sits, even more apparent from the Broadway side. So I don't know if that a good job of answering um, uh, Stephen, uh, the, the question which has now disappeared because I've answered it. Is there any truth to the story that in the 1890s, the trustees were offered by a trustee search committee land on Morningside a lot more than what they ultimately purchased from 110 to 125th Morningside Park, but turned down as excessive, not needed. It's a great story, even if not true. That comes from an anonymous attendee. So if I find the answer to it, I won't know. Um, <clears throat> I won't know who to who to refer to. I think the place to look, however, since Benjamin Franklin said knowledge is knowing or knowing where to find out, is in the other book that came out in the late 90s, Professor Andrew Dolcart's uh, wonderful book on the history of Morningside Heights. Uh, he has much, much more detail uh, there. But if I find out, I'll try to find out how to filter that, um, that to you. Your view of the law school architecture, both on its own and relative to the rest of the campus. Um, I don't think that for me that the law school is one of the finest buildings of Harrison and Abramovitz, but um, uh, it, it, it's essentially for me as though Columbia was building its own little Lincoln Center over on um, uh, on East Campus. Uh, from the first, it was it presumed that it was going to sit on a pedestal, and in the end, the bridge didn't use work that well. Uh, and uh, I think James Bolshek did a wonderful remodeling of the corner, making it a much more um, friendly uh, and humane building there. Another person who I suppose suffered by living in Carmen then called New Hall. Uh, what if Carmen New Hall and Ferris Booth Hall, which were described by a professor in the 1960s as resembling a giraffe making love to a mongoose sideways? Yes, many of the buildings have um, derogatory names suggesting that Columbia's architectural history is not really of the most enchanting between about 1950 uh, and uh, the late 1970s, uh, Carmen Hall was in fact a, um, designed by the same architects, hard to believe, who designed um, uh, the Empire State Building, a later generation of that firm, Shreve Lamb and Harmon. Uh, it was designed for use on several campuses. And so there are versions of uh, Carmen Hall on other New York State campuses that had something to do with funding the State Dormitory um, Authority. Uh, Ferris Booth Hall, on the other hand, uh, uh, was a, a rather sympathetic, inclined uh, plane of glass that gave it a wonderful vista for the student center over the um, over the campus. Um, here, Gary, the Mar yes, while we're looking at the lovely Eurus Hall, can you comment on the new facade that was added? What do you think of it? And also on Eurus's future with the business school moving out. Um, so there was an attempt to integrate 
Furious Hall when a little, a, sm a relatively small expansion was needed uh, circa 1980. The architect Peter, Peter Gluck, uh, who was then moving in a postmodern version, uh, added a, a stone facade. He kind of pulled the lower floors forward. And what he did was a very clever move was he decided he would create the pendant to the rear elevation of Low Library. So he took the cornice line of the back facade of Low Library uh, and ev evoked both its dimensions and its proportions uh, to try to integrate Uris Hall and make us a little bit forget um, the sort of factory issued um, curtain wall windowed um, office tower above. It is currently being used as swing space for um, activities of campus where buildings are being renovated, McKim Building. Uh, what its absolute full future is, is not 100% decided as far as I know, but I might be wrong, but there are great plans for creating a new undergraduate library that will be uh, crafted out of the former business school library now that that's been um, abandoned, that will have spaces for uh, teamwork, for working with state-of-the-art um, electronic uh, uh, um, equipment, uh, and so a real addition to the library system. Is there enough dormitory space for undergraduates now? If not, is there any space for it on um, the campus? I don't actually know the statistical question to that. I don't think there's quite the crunch that there has been. Of course, the uh, East Campus supplied a great deal of more dormitory space, and there are other dormitories that have been built uh, in recent decades um, off of campus. Um, I don't think anyone is eager to lessen the green space uh, of Columbia, even though there are a total of, I would say, seven unbuilt sites on the McKim Master Plan of 1993. Um, Stephen Ross asked, Hillary Ballin emphasized the Georgian rather than the Gothic architecture and the campus's openness to the city. Um, yes, I think that's true. I was trying to emphasize the openness to the city, the rejection of the neo-Gothic that had been at 49th Street and was still a very dominant mode. Uh, think of the Yale colleges that are built actually in the 19th, after, right after the First World War. So neo-Gothic has a very long life in campus architecture, but it's something that Columbia very definitively uh, rejected in the 1890s when it preferred this civic architecture. And I think um, my former colleague, uh, who's sadly no longer with us, Hillary Ballin, was absolutely right in emphasizing that there's a Georgian quality to the brick buildings, although the detailing is rather more for me, um, Italian palazzo, uh, it's really the brickness that gives us a sort of, uh, of a Georgian feeling. Then we have um, here some more questions pouring in. Were Lerner Hall and the Bakerfield renovation considered at the time of the Manhattanville planning? or um, considered separately. I think Lerner Hall actually predates the Manhattanville expansion. It, um, it was actually already, it was under construction when I did the, plan, the exhibition Mastering McKim's Plan in 1997. Uh, and so it's uh, you know, uh, a kind of densification and rebuilding of Ferris Booth Hall. I think likewise the Baker Field uh, renovation, which has a brilliant building I would love to show you, by Stephen Hall's kind of field house there uh, is a completely um, separate operation from um, Manhattanville, although it overlapped with the early uh, phases of Manhattanville. So I think, unless I'm mistaken, that there are no other questions. And the open is one. That one, oh yeah, here. If you could redo any building on the campus, which would it be, and what what would you do? Well, I'm sure that the powers that be in the central administration would not agree with the expense that would be involved. But if I could redo any building, it would be uh, Uris Hall, although it's extremely well built. It's the Uris Construction Company is one of the uh, most capable building development uh, construction companies in the city then and for many years afterwards. Their archives, in fact, are here in the Avery Architectural Library. So it's a very, very well built building. Um, but one would like something that was a bit more Legion and university uh, looking, uh, at least from um, uh, from the outside. At the very least, I wouldn't mind at all a, uh, a kind of redressing of it. Uh, one last question I think I can answer because we're right about at our closing time. I think of a few um, remarks, uh, perhaps. 
uh, from our organizers right before we all sign off, right before we all run and get some lunch. The proposed gym that was abandoned in 1968 was not only a symbol of inequality, but an encroachment on public parkland. How did Columbia ever get the city to agree to alienate a portion of Morningside Park? Um, so that is uh, a really interesting subject, which remained a little bit in the dark for many years uh, until um, the widow of Professor George Collins, who was one of, my pre one of my teachers and one of my predecessors here in the Department of Art History, great architectural historian. He and his wife, Christiane Collins, who recently passed away, were very active in the fight against the park and in the development of the Friends of Morningside Park. They created an archive of that very tumultuous period, uh, which is now in the Schoenberg Library, Harlem branch of the New York Public Library on 135th Street. Uh, it was then exploited partly by Andrew Dolcart in his book on Morningside Heights, but in particular in a book that uh, Christiane Collins published just before she passed away on the history of the gym. So if anyone wants to get a hold of that, uh, you can get uh, the story in all of its gory details, including the deal that was made with the Lindsay administration. Uh, and I don't know if there were underhanded parts of it, uh, in which this, the university was going to provide a public gymnasium on the lower floor because the building was built into the cliffside. If you go in Morningside Park today, you'll see an extraordinary kind of boulder water uh, feature at about the level of 112th Street. That is disguising the um, dynamiting of the cliff to begin the construction for the gym. So you can still actually see the results of the dynamiting, but it has now been turned into an ornamental uh, waterfall, um, which is very popular. People go and watch the waterfall there and a lot of aquatic birds, but that is in fact the peaceful patching over of a very sad moment in both Columbia's history and in the fact in the city's history because Morningside Park uh, was then in a state of near total abandonment. So there are no more open questions. I, as you can hear, I could speak until dinner time easily on the history of campus. I hope if any of you uh, are on campus uh, and you find me in your office, you'll come and ask questions directly, but it's been a pleasure to give you a whirlwind slide tour uh, of uh, Columbia's concept of an urban architecture for learning. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us today and sharing your unique perspective and insight um, and we also want to thank everyone for attending and, of course, uh, our colleagues Ashley and Hannah who are behind the scenes and made this event possible. Uh, before everyone logs off, we also want to remind you that um, Parade of Classes Breakfast and Banner Parade, which uh, is going to be taking place as usual on campus on Class Day. Uh, it's coming up. It's going to be Tuesday, May 14th at 8 a.m. Uh, more details to follow. So take that date and hopefully you can uh, attend and see campus for yourself, maybe see it uh, from a from a different perspective now that we have all this incredible context and and we can participate in that. So thanks again for for attending and and thank you, Professor Barry, for uh, for joining us. Okay. Bye everyone.